everyone. And just a correction, I'm no longer at the FTC, just to be, uh, that was last year. Uh, so my talk today is about data privacy. And uh, we've talked quite a bit about how big data is booming. Um, but I'm going to talk a bit about how there's very little transparency or understanding into what the underlying data practices are, and that there are a lot of opportunities for innovation. Right? And I'm going to use a kind of a different analogy today. Who, who had the nuggets during the break? Right? Did, did, do folks have the nuggets? Um, so the question is, how do you feel once you learn about the underlying um, way nuggets are made? Right? Um, there was a power outage in Virginia about a week ago. And, and due to a, a, a few minutes, I think it was like under 15 minutes, 60,000 chickens died. And so to think about the kind of the conditions that they must be raised in, uh, such that a, you know, a 15 minute power outage causes so much stuff, is kind of cause for concern. And so the question is, how do we feel about it? What do we want to do about it? And I think we can step to um, that, that analogy where maybe data privacy is similar to the environmental issues, right? It's our environmental issues of 2012. Um, and so, big data. So we're gonna, there was a great piece in last week's um, Wall Street Journal series that my colleagues did about all the different ways that your data can be tracked. Right? This is like from your in-car in GPS devices, license plate cameras, facial recognition cameras, set-top boxes, offline data enhancement through conversion tracking or loyalty cards, and your web browsing. And, and, and kind of internet browsing and mobile browsing is my expertise. And so this seems like a gold mine, right? This seems like a great opportunity for data and innovation, but it's also a cause for concern, right? So data doesn't magically just come out of nowhere, right? Data is usually tied to an individual. It's tied to a person that, that created that data as a result of their clickstream or their activity, and it has kind of a person behind it. And again, to use the environmental analogy, when you kind of extract uh, resources from some environment, you're hurting people, you're affecting people, and sometimes that has kind of, uh, kind of a great effect. My, my sister's an environmentalist. Her organization um, brought an action against Chevron, uh, which settled for $18 billion for removing people from their land and taking their resources. And so I want to kind of put that in, in, in that framing. Right? And so when we speak about data and people, you know, people's data, um, and there was a, the earlier panel talked on it as well, I want to kind of clarify that there's kind of different kinds of data, right? So there's, there's data that I knowingly share with a site or service. This is like I share it with Amazon, I share it with Pandora, I share it when I, you know, when I book recommendation. Um, and that's explicitly shared. Um, there's data that I share via a site or service uh, to, uh, to communicate with another person or another entity. This is you know, phone calls, emails. This could even be Twitter, right? So Twitter, I actually post it for a particular audience and a particular context, and we'll probably talk about that at the panel. And then there's data that's collected and shared without the user actually knowing or having any awareness or control. And that's kind of the, the realm of, um, that's the area that I kind of am most interested in, and I think that's one of the most problematic areas that we should discuss, right? This is passive data collection. And so when we talk about it, this is kind of otherwise often known as third party tracking, or tracking by the party um, that the user does not have an interaction with or a relationship with. Um, and so this is a standard web page. Most of you know this already. I'm just going to go through it quickly. Um, a lot of the elements on this page are not actually um, fr from the Huffington Post, from the first party that I'm visiting. The widgets, the advertisement, the sharing widgets, they're all third party elements, right? And some of these are visible. Some of these are invisible pieces of uh, you know, one by one pixels or JavaScript. Some people call them beacons um, that are embedded in the page. And this is kind of the, what a, you know, a beacon looks like technically. But the core Four elements to think about when you consider this are um, there's an observer, an identifier, and an activity. Right. So the observer in this case is QuantServe. It's a third-party analytics company. There's an identifier, which is my cookie value. That's how to uniquely refer to me or my computer, me as an individual. And then there's an activity, which is I read that page, the story that I read. And the combination of these identifier, observer, uh, the observer identity, uh, activity pairs are um, what create your your social network profile. So these actually your profile. Sorry, not your social network, your behavioral profile. Um, these, these, uh, these data points are what create your identity online or your profile online. And some of the, you know, the, some of the data that goes into this profile are, are, for example, me searching for the location of this hotel or looking at it for a restaurant on, on Yelp or perhaps reading a story around, um, oh, I don't know, uh, uh, kind of a Frankfurt Auto Show. Um, this is what goes into my profile. And the profiles that I get put into are these examples. Nugat is a, you know, they, they do some of this behavioral um, profiling as well. And this, this, this is, I think, from, I um, can't remember whose catalog it is, but they classify high spenders, which is kind of 
not necessarily a profile, or maybe it's a profile you want to be in, but it's one of the profiles that you can be put into. And so I don't know if it means you get better rates or better deals if you're a high spender, better offers, or do you actually, you know, do, you, do they think you're a sucker and you'll buy anything, so we'll charge you more. It's not clear, but this is the type of kind of data profiling that happens. And it's not just profiling for the sense of like behavioral targeting, right? I know a lot of the discussion in privacy has been around behavioral advertising and, and behavioral profiling, um, and that's what, what um, that's, kind of a, that's kind of a red herring. Um, the behavioral advertising, those profiles, are where you see the profiling happening and you see the data being collected. But for just the standard economics of the web for advertising, um, you know, profiling happens for tracking impressions, tracking clicks, tracking referrals, tracking conversions. And these are based on identification of a unique visitor, right? So, so to get paid for some number of impressions, you need to be able to uniquely say, to, to, to say you had X number of unique visitors visit your site. And that's a currency in this economy, right? And so there's a lot of tension around this, 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 type, of, um, this type of tracking. And so my work, a lot of my work uh, was around trying to measure the prevalence of this tracking. And so for my grad, uh, uh, graduate work, I looked into the prevalence of the top 100 most visited websites to see what the prevalence of um, third party uh, trackers are. And um, a, a good way to view this, for example, is if you look at this graphic, um, across the top are the unique trackers. This is like DoubleClick, uh, you know, Anal Google Analytics, Nugget, perhaps. This is from 2009, so perhaps not. Um, and on the left are the top 100 websites, right? These are, you know, Yahoo, Google, Facebook, these kind of things. And what you find is on some repeated visits to, to some websites like Blogspot, you can get 100 different beacons. You know, sometimes you get up to 30 or 40 different third parties on the page. These are people trying to behavioral profile you for ad targeting. This is just simply measurement. This is analytics. This is kind of, uh, this is the, the gamut of, of, of tracking on a web page. The other interesting data point is single observers, right? Single entities. So this is um, Google, right? So Google was on 92 of the top 100 websites. So that means on 92 different websites, as you uh, tr browse the web, one entity is able to correlate your activity. And so that's a pretty dominant position in terms of your different activities on, say, uh, different sites that you might want to keep different, right? So my activity on WebMD, I might want to keep different from my activity on Walgreens, right? And I don't want to maybe tie that information together or, or when I'm purchasing insurance. We're finding that single entities have coverage across those, those laterals. And it's not just on the web, right? Sorry. Uh, Smartphones, too, we have this, a similar issue, right? So in smartphones, the same type of profiling occurs, but for, until recently, the, um, the identity that was used to profile you was persistent, as the serial number associated to your device, right? So on your iPhone, you had a UDID, on your Android phone, you have this device ID, and those were kind of embedded in the device for the life of the device, right? So unless you sold your device, you couldn't actually get rid of that profiling. And so we did a similar type of study for the journal where we looked into the leakage of things like your UDID, your location information, your username, your password, and the key elements here were that your location and your phone ID, right? This UDID and the sensitive piece of information, which is where you're located. And we found that 47 of the top 100 apps we looked at sent location to one or more parties, and 56 of them, more than half, sent these unique device IDs, right? And sometimes address books, I'm sure everyone knows the path issues, sometimes photos, um, but this is kind of a concern. You, you know, you find things like your alarm clock app, right? This is your, like, this is, this is still in the app store, I kind of I mentioned it in most of my talks. Um, it's, a, it's one of the most popular alarm clock apps in the store. And every time your alarm goes off, it sends your precise lat long, so your precise location, and your device ID to a bunch of third parties that you've never had any interaction with and you've never known about. And so to the degree that any of these third parties now have a, a history of your location, some people have cause for concern. Right? And this ecosystem is quite large. This is an example, I, uh, I use this in a Senate testimony, um, of all the different kind of ways your location information is shared. And so this is the example I gave earlier was your app, which sends your location to a third party. The wireless carriers themselves, right, so the T-Mobiles and the O2s, they also provide APIs for developers to connect to the back end and get that location uh, directly from the back end for phones that don't have location information or to reduce battery. Right, reduce battery consumption, right? So this is like, um, you know, a third party website like Looped can connect directly to Verizon and get my location information from the server side. With my consent, of course, but this is just um, an example of kind of how the data flows. And so we're told, well, this isn't a problem. This is the marketplace. Consumers have choice. They can opt out. They can delete their cookies. They can, uh, you know, um, 
block third-party cookies on their browser. They can limit ad tracking. Um, this is the general kind of um, privacy controls for those rare set of users that care about their privacy. I would argue most users don't know of this activity, so most users don't set these settings. But even for the ones that do, a lot of my research has shown, for example, that when users would delete their cookies, uh, analytics companies or advertisers would use other persistent storage on their systems to um, track their activity. This is things like flash cookies, right? So in 2009, I, I did a study looking at uh, top 100 websites using flash cookies and found companies like Hulu and Spotify engaging this action called respawning, which is when you delete your cookies, they would just resurrect them from the, from the flash store because it's an external store that your browser doesn't delete. So it became another form of persistent storage. And they were able to track you across multiple browsers as well. So if you only did like, you know, banking in one browser and other kinds of activity in another browser, they were able to correlate that activity through these external flash cookies, right? And we looked again uh, in 2000, so, so they were sued. There was a bunch of lawsuits. There was a bunch of settlements. And then we looked again in 2011, and Hulu, which was one of the companies, they're still, were still engaging in this practice, but this time they had even developed a more sophisticated method um, using uh, browser cache and HTML5. So um, eTags is a form of browser cache that tells you kind of when a file was modified, but they were storing unique tracking properties in those, in those files as well. Same type of thing. Um, you guys might have seen the Wall Street Journal uh, coverage of the Google Safari issue, whereby Google was kind of um, circumventing third-party blocking settings on Safari users. This is like, if you're a Safari user, um, you are opted out of third-party tracking by default, right? So unless you have a first-party relationship with a company, they're not able to track you by default, which is a privacy-preserving setting. And Google went around these settings uh, to enable tracking on their double-click ad network, right? So we've seen this multiple times. We've seen a ton of different mechanisms to do this. So, you know, HTML5, um, third-party like button tracking, um, fingerprinting. Um, this is all the ways that you can currently circumvent um, third-party blocking and co deletion of cookies, right? So I can go into the list of them, but things like cookie syncing, which is forwarding uh, from one domain to another to en enable uh, kind of unique identification of an individual. Um, CSS history sniffing, which is exploiting browser features. Um, one of the most interesting areas, I think, is around um, for two, two things, actually. One is offline enhancement. Offline enhancement is where um, using your real name or some pixeling or some coupon offer, they're able to link uh, online activity, like how many ads you were shown, to purchases, in-store purchases, either using a loyalty card or using data sharing agreements with your credit card company. Um, and then the other kind of the, the big killer, which we might want to talk about, is logged in services, right? So most people never log out of Gmail, right? Most people never log out of Facebook, right? Once you're logged in to those services, you leave those persistent cookies, and they're able um, to track you not only in the, your interactions with Gmail, but any third-party site that has a Google Plus widget, for example, right? So they get that, that um, identity and is tied to your real identity in that case, or your real email. And so what's the impact? So what's the big deal of this stuff, right? Um, so I think it, overall, the reason this is of, of concern is, one, you just get a general lack of trust in the marketplace. When you see these kind of circumvention and we see this lack of transparency and when consumers are surprised to, to learn that their settings were not respected or there's an underlying data practice that they were not comfortable with, I think you just you lose trust in the marketplace and you, you kind of the mar marketplace starts, stops working as efficiently. Um, the other problem is that there's more data available to law enforcement, right? As there's um, more data collected, there's more and more sur sources of data. So in California, for example, we have this thing called FastPass, which is like, it lets you drive through uh, the freeway tolls quickly. So you don't have to you know, pay money every time you go through a toll booth. You just use this, this identity. It's one of the most frequently um, accessed pieces of information for divorce cases, right? So you're like, I was, you know, I was at work, and they subpoena information. They're like, actually, you were not at work. You were across this bridge, right? So we find as this data persists in multiple outlets, people will find interesting uses for them. And interesting could often be privacy kind of uh, privacy violating uses. Um, there's, by collecting and storing this information widely, there's additional security and privacy exposure, which is a lot of what I've worked on. And there's just this general sense of discomfort, right? This is like looking at how chickens are made and f just feeling kind of not very happy about it. And I think maybe, you know, one argument is we just live with it. The other argument is maybe we try to make things a bit better, you know, in the way we bring chickens up and we, we you know, our food supply. Maybe we, we do the same type of thing in our data supply. Maybe we try to be more proactive and, and how we get data, uh, how comfortable users are with our data collection and sharing and their kind of experience. And I'll talk about a couple impacts. So 
I don't know if you, anyone saw this last month, there was a bunch of uh, something like a million UDIDs leaked. <laughs> Um, that was or originally, UDIDs are these unique identifiers for cell phone. There was a big data dump, a leak, um, that was an initially attributed to the FBI, but in fact it was not. It was uh, due to a third party, um, actually they're a first party and third party, this company called Blue Coat that provides magazines. So if you have like an iPad and you have like, um, you know, Variety magazine or, or New Yorker magazine, they're, they're, the, they're the kind of the facilitator, the, the analytics package. And so they leaked this huge database of, they had 12 million was the claim of UDIDs, right? And so what's the big deal? These are these identifiers. So a lot of my work has shown, for example, just by using a UDID, I can hijack people's Facebook and Twitter accounts because of poor settings and apps, right? So I can take over anyone's, you know, account using these, these, uh, these pseudo-anonymous identifiers. And a good friend of mine, I think we called it Facepalm, a good friend of mine also um, on, the, on your right um, uh, was able to link any user social network info with that UDID as well. So even if you're not logged into a service, you can actually tie someone's username and log in an email with those UDIDs, right? So that's, uh, you know, if you can think of all the, the times where you might not want to reveal that information where it's revealed. Um, you also find that there's a lot of opportunities in this space, right? So for example, um, a good, good case study is Twitter. So Twitter recently uh, engaged in this practice where they are now tracking users even before they visit Twitter um, in order to make recommendations in the same way that the Bitly guy was speaking about how to make recommendations for friends you might want to follow. Twitter is now doing this. Um, they track, even if you've never signed into Twitter, they've been tracking you for some period of time so that when you sign into Twitter, they will say, you should follow these people. And they've, they've done that by tracking your browsing history. So they're like, oh, if you like privacy and you know, video games, you, you might like this other person, right? Um, but they did it in a very interesting way. They were, they were very transparent about the fact that they were doing this and they provided a real, kind of a consent in the form of uh, do not track. They provided a reliable opt-out mechanism for consumers and they allow people to, um, if they're uncomfortable with this, express their opt-out, right? And this is a good opportunity for Twitter to say what the value is, which is like we, we can track you to, you know, uh, help you find people to follow and extract more value from our service, but you're allowed to opt out if you're uncomfortable. I thought that was a very good example. Um, earlier, we talked about digital shadows. Um, in grad school, I did a project called Digital Shadow, which was literally a projection of all the data that I've shared, and it would follow me around the room as I would uh, kind of interact with people, as a reminder of like what my digital shadow is, what my privacy exposure is. Kind of like you wouldn't leave the house without looking in the mirror. This was kind of that idea of like create an environment where when you have user data, you provide them the ability to see what kind of data uh, they're sharing, what their exposure might may be, and not, you know, kind of for, for them to adjust it. And then finally, um, I know some people are going to push back on, on this, but limit retention, right? So there's a good thing to be said about, um, you know, as data geeks, as people that are trying to innovate in this space, we want to keep every piece of data possible such that it might give us a new breakthrough, a new insight, a new business model. We'll find a use for it that we didn't initially see in our business plan and we'll want to do something cool with it. Now everyone, everyone has that mentality, but it's, you got to realize it's kind of like that mentality of keeping old toasters in your attic in the case that you might need parts from it, right? It probably, there's the rare case that you might find it useful, but in a lot of times it actually exposes you to things like leakage. It exposes you to, to problems that users might find, uh, find uh, problematic. You, you might actually find, you know, law enforcement comes and, and asks you, uh, for information. I was giving an example earlier. When I worked at the New York Times, they, uh, they, ha they, have, they have laws against law enforcement asking for sources from reporters. But the New York Times had a zero data retention policy. After you've done a story, you would delete your, your notebook and your files. And so when law enforcement came to ask them, they didn't have to get lawyers to fight back. They just said, we don't have this data. You can't, you can't get it from us. And that, that actually saved them money at the end. So that's something else to think about. So that's my talk.